what are brain boosting nootropic supplements and do they actually work? In this week's episode of the Mind Body Peak Performance Podcast, that is exactly the topic that we are going to explore together. You'll learn about how nootropics work, the benefits, the risks and side effects, common ingredients, how to optimally combine ingredients to get a synergistic effect, the one single most important factor you can use to determine if your biology is currently responding well or poorly to a nootropic, and then how to design your own nootropic experiments. Later in the episode, we discussed one particular ingredient that does not do well in my system for whatever reason. And our guest broke down how he would evaluate the issue. And we got sidetracked before we could really elucidate the actual process. So you can use this methodology or framework later in your own experiments to make sure that everything goes well and you find the source of any particular possible problems. Our guest this week is Dr. Greg Kelly. He's the Director of Product Development at Neurohacker Collective, a naturopathic physician and author of the book Shapeshift. He was the editor of the journal Alternative Medicine Review and has been an instructor at the University of Bridgeport in the College of Naturopathic Medicine, where he taught classes in advanced clinical nutrition, counseling skills, and doctor-patient relationships. Dr. Kelly has published hundreds of articles on natural medicine and nutrition, contributed three chapters to the textbook of natural medicine, and has more than 30 journal articles indexed on PubMed. His areas of expertise include nootropics, anti-aging and regenerative medicine, weight management, sleep, and the chronobiology of performance and health. This is the third episode I've recorded with the folks at Neurohacker Collective. You can find the previous episodes at mindbodypeak.com slash the number 119 most recently with Dr. Nick Bits, and then episode number 80, mindbodypeak.com slash 80, also with Dr. Nick Bits on a different subject. Everything we discuss, the links to the resources, will be in the show notes for this one at mindbodypeak.com slash the number 122. If you'd like to try out any of Neurohacker's products, you can use the code URBAN, and that'll save you 15% on anything in their Qualia line. If you find this masterclass on nootropics helpful, go ahead and hit the thumbs up if you're on YouTube or drop a review for the show on whatever podcast platform you're using. That's what helps the show grow and how I continue bringing you thought-provoking guests like Dr. Kelly. All right, let's bring in Dr. Greg Kelly. Greg, welcome to Mind Body Peak Performance. Thanks for having me on today. So I don't know if you know this, but Qualia... Your mind product was one of the first nootropics I used when I was getting started and was looking around for the most thorough formulations out there. So today we'll be discussing all things brain, cognition, and nootropics. Sounds awesome. One of my favorite topics. Yes. Let's set the stage. What is a interesting fact about the brain or cognition or cognitive decline that will lead into what we're talking about today? I think one of the things, I think many people have heard the idea of 10,000 hours. You put in 10,000 hours and because of practice, neuroplasticity, et cetera, you know, we get to be expert at something. But one of the things I think that I'd like the audience to know is it's, we need to put in the effort, but it needs to be both focused effort. And then our brain has to have the resources to change. So like one of the, the sayings is without acetylcholine, 10,000 hours would be wasted. So acetylcholine becomes a big emphasis in nootropic stacks. Yes, and we'll talk about the basics of an effective nootropic stack, and you guys have gone above and beyond the basics in your product. Before we do, what are the unusual or non-negotiables you've done so far today for your health, your performance, and your bioharmony? So I, um, I started in my day listening to what I 
I think of loosely as ceremony music from um, Rhythmia is a plant medicine place in Costa Rica, and they play certain soundtracks um, during their ceremonies. So that's how I start my day. Always, uh, I wake up and then shortly after put on some ceremony music to just get my head and heart in the right space for the day. And then after that, I live in a wonderful place um, near the ocean in um, San Diego County. I just go out and walk, usually to a coffee shop to get some coffee, but something to get me outside and get that morning light. And then I like to, um, I, I, caffeine's a really powerful thing. We'll talk a bit about caffeine, but it also tends to anchor us to things that we have with it. So products that it's in, places we have it, people we share it with. And so I try to be intentional about my caffeine use and have it mostly in a social environment as a way to just anchor myself into like getting around people early in the day as well. So those would be the th three things I did today to start my day. What is it about the caffeine that has an anchoring effect? Well, there we so one of the things, cool things about our brain is it's always trying to predict the future. Like that's its job one. If you remember nothing else about the brain, it's it's a prediction machine. And so one of the things it does to predict well is pair things together. So think of Pavlov's dog, that classic conditioning. And certain things act as really stronger conditioning factors than others. And caffeine is one of those strong conditioning factors. So, um, I mean, you could get into the weeds and say, oh, well, caffeine, you know, promotes dopamine and things like that, which dopamine is, is the molecule that does that pairing of things. But fundamentally, the key thing to remember about caffeine, aside from its physiological effects that it's most well known for, is its very strong anchoring ability. So, when we have caffeine, especially if we repeatedly do it, our brain learns like, oh, this is like a dopamine environment, right? Like, so if like during, say, um, lockdown, during that time period, I just drank my coffee here at my apartment and looked out over the ocean. But over time, it got so my brain learned like, oh, caffeine solo, like we don't interact with people. And, um, and that's not what I want. I want my use of caffeine to largely be something that drives some type of social connection. So I try to be intentional where I have it, what I'm doing when I have it, and, you know, even with who I have it, right? Like um, anything that's a strong conditioning factor, we pair that with the experience. And so when we have that, our, our brain will want more of that, that experience, if that makes sense, right? So if like if if we only drink caffeine like me in my you know in my home we learn to only want caffeine in our home and if we only have it in a social environment we learn to want to have more of that social environment. What if you mix it up and you have caffeine or coffee in your house half the time and half the time in a social environment? Yeah, so then then it wouldn't be as strong a pairing, right? So then it would be like that would be ideal if we wanted to be more neutral. I do that once in a while. So sometimes if I have an early podcast or meeting, I'll have coffee here. But mostly in terms of trying to create that strength of anchoring, I value, it's easy for me to just get into my grind and focus and get stuff done. Um, I want to start my day with some more social connections than I would have since I live by myself. So I, I'm just using caffeine as my little nudge in that direction. Yeah, this is getting into the weeds a bit, but if you were to take, say, a metabolite of caffeine like paraxanthine, and you were to use one of those in the home and the other socially at a coffee shop with friends, what would happen to the anchoring effect there? I don't think paraxanthine, honestly, is strong enough. Like, no one's really studied what metabolites of caffeine would do the anchoring. They've always just looked at caffeine, but this is how I understand it. About 80% of what caffeine is metabolized into is paraxanthine, but relatively little caffeine gets metabolized, if that makes sense. So most of what we're feeling isn't the paraxanthine or the other metabolites, it's the caffeine molecule that gets to our brain <laughs> and does things. All right, let's rewind a bit now and talk about cognitive decline specifically, because that's a increasingly con big concern and issue in today's day and age. And that's like the opposite end of the spectrum and nootropics is more on the performance side. So 
What would you say is important to know and understand about cognitive decline? For me, fundamentally, energy is at the heart of everything. It's whether it's like nootropics. So the original term nootropic came from a Romanian chemist that created, um, at the time he synthesized paracetam, like the original racetam. And, um, and then in animals, it worked as a nootropic, right? Nootropic means mind shaping, mind bending. So it, it neuroplasticity, think of that as a good synonym. But what he was trying to then determine was, well, what is paracetam doing? in these animals that's allowing them to learn and remember a lot better. And one of his explanations was ATP. So energy that it was doing something with brain energetics. And so whether we're talking that nootropic angle, like more focus, concentration, willpower to put into our day or cognitive issues as we get olding, energy would unite both with like more of it being, you know, something that's going to allow our brain just to perform at a higher level. And, um, do you know the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman? Yeah. yeah. So so for the audience, he introduces two characters. So don't think of these as real. Think of them as useful. But he his characters are system one and system two thinking. And by system one, what he meant was like basically think of somewhat being zoned out and our brain just on autopilot, just going with whatever requires the least amount of effort. And system two was... Um, What I would think of in what we'll talk about later is executive function and uh, attention domains. It's when we're focusing our attention, we're avoiding distractions, we're digging into memory, we're maintaining good self-control. So we're not, you know, tempted by, you know, uh, distracting things in our environment and we're maintaining good emotional self-control and things like that. Those take a lot more energy for the brain to do. And so when energy is um, in short supply, system one thinking takes over and system two, we just don't get to. So most of what we want our brain to do to be high performing, you know, biohackers are things that require system two to say, no, I got this and step up and energy becomes probably the most limiting factor. And then the other thing, what, what you'd see with aging but you'd also see this with a lot of challenges you know, at an earlier age is some degree of um, inflammation, for lack of a better way to describe it, right? That there's these other things going on in the brain that are also interfering with it performing at its best. So um, th- those would be just shared things in both of those. And the last piece is we tend to think of our brain as this one, you know, like one big thing, right? But our brain has many different jobs. Um, so what neuroscientists would do is they'll drop or they'll describe um, these big cognitive buckets or domains. So executive function would be one. Another's social cognition, um, learning and memory is a third. Um, attention is a fourth. Visual sensory so think of like you know like our visual and movement centers interacting together and then language and then under each of those big buckets then there's specific skills so in attention we have things like focusing our attention right sustaining it for long periods of time avoiding being distracted um, processing speed so how quickly um, we can respond to things in our environment like those are all in that domain executive function that's our working memory and working memory it's a little bit like the RAM on our computer. It's the ability to hold something in our memory as we're, we're using it. Um, but willpower is another part of executive function and setting goals and being, they call it cognitive flexibility, but fundamentally being able to change our mind or our, our perspective. So these big categories, they take a lot more energy and they, they require resources. And so when I think of Nootropics, in the barest sense, they're providing those resources. They're allowing our brain to be more efficient. They're working on things like neuroplasticity. So, um, you know, the brain can not waste energy unnecessarily. And so what are like the main ways that nootropics work to promote better brain function? Like there's blood oxygenation or brain oxygenation. There's better nutrient delivery. There's reducing the amount of damage occurring in the brain. What are the big ones? I mean, I think all those are fair. Another one that you wouldn't have mentioned there would be neurotransmitters. So um, 
So when you think of, okay, what's the brain using all this energy for? Because the brain is by far the biggest energy consumer. Um, it's estimated about 20% of our calories that we consume each day are used by the brain for energy. So it's, you know, our brain weighs a couple pounds, but it's just churning through energy. And so one of the big things it's using that for is to make neurotransmitters and then do the signaling that neurotransmitters do. And neurotransmitters are things like the acetylcholine I mentioned and dopamine or serotonin. And, you know, each neurotransmitter has, you know, somewhat different roles. But at any point in time, um, Candace Pert was famous and she was a PhD, um, but for her term, molecules of emotion. So at any given point in time, our different brain regions, but our brain as a whole would almost have this soup of neurotransmitters and other molecules that it's make. And that soup is going to dictate to a large extent, like, you know, are we focused? Are we having great um, ability to stay like in those core executive function suites or not. And so signaling neurotransmitters and their signal is one. Another huge one is our senses. Because fundamentally, like I said, the brain's about prediction. And one of the things that it cares most about predicting (laughs) is, is this place safe for for the person that I'm living in? Right. So even when we're asleep and you think, oh, the brain can't be using much energy, we're asleep, right? Like, but the brain's using a crazy amount of energy during sleep. And some of that, a lot of it's dictated or put into um, auditory to, to make sure that our brain's constantly scanning the environment to make sure it stays safe during sleep. It's why loud noises or unexpected noises can cause us to wake. Um, so that sensory signal. And then you touched on another one, which was that repairing damage or cleaning itself up is a big part of how brain energy is used. So, so those things, if there is not enough energy, one or more of those always would be sacrifice, which is why often I come back to like a core part of nootropics is there's some energetic component, right? They're either improving signaling, they're doing something to decrease, um, you know, like oxidative stress or something that's sucking up resources, or they're helping to build neurotransmitters. Um, all these things that our brain needs to do and has to dedicate most of its energy into. Yeah, it's complex. And at the same time, so every nootropic will improve or modulate at least one of those. Yes, I think that's safe to say. And often, you know, most of the mechanism studies on nootropics, and frankly, everything is done on animals, right? Because that's where you can dissect a brain and, and uh, you know, like look at pathways and things like that. But yeah, like even something like Inco, as an example, right? That's been, you know, um, I, I've been a naturopathic doctor since 96 and was a student before that. But ginkgo was among the, you know, the most common herbs when I was in school and still is. And one of the things ginkgo is well known for doing is impre- increasing blood flow. You know, something else you mentioned, right? So with more blood flow, more resources, more um, building blocks for making energy can be carried to regions of our brain. And when our brain's working hard. so Think of um, our brain as having regions that are networked together. But one you'll often hear about for focus and executive function is the prefrontal cortex. So that's right here in the front of our brain. And um, I like to think of that part of the brain as the part that lets us do the hard thing when it's the right thing. In a simple sense is if we're not getting enough like nutritional support, right? Enough blood flow, enough nutrients, enough building blocks to make neurotransmitters you need it then we're going to do the system one thing. We'll do the easy thing instead of the right thing. And so you see that a lot in the world and in our daily lives, right? Like how often do people step up and do the hard thing when it's the right thing? You know, not as much as doing the easy thing because it's convenient. And the way, you know, I encourage our audience to think about it is don't blame someone for doing, you know, the easy thing instead of the right thing. Think of that as, oh, their brain probably didn't have the resources it needed to do the hard thing when it was the right thing. Is there a risk of combining different nootropics and say stimulating blood flow too much in the brain? I'm a big fan of thinking of almost everything unless proven otherwise is following a Goldilocks principle. So, you know, there's likely to be a just right range of something and caffeine's a good example. Um, So there's two general dose curves that you'll see in pharmacology. One is 
I think of as as more is better up until a point, and then more beyond that isn't worse. It's just not any much better, right? Like you just hit a plateau and stay there. And so if you think of that attention bucket, especially like reaction speed, more caffeine past a certain amount won't make you do something faster, but it won't slow it down. Like those, those simple types of um, attention tasks, caffeine, you'll probably peak somewhere between 50 and 200 milligrams, an average person. If you had 400, you won't get worse, but you won't get, you know, like, oh, twice as much better. You'll just get about the same. You would have had, had 50 to 200. But there's another curve and think of like an upside down U. And that, it's, it's a biphasic curve and it's called the yerkes dodson law. And caffeine was what they originally looked at. For a lot of executive functions, caffeine past a certain amount actually makes you worse. So it improves it up to a point, And then after that amount, caffeine would worsen it. So caffeine for simple tasks, reaction speeds, processing speed, um, you know, more is not better, but more is not worse. But for some of the things I would care most about, which would be, you know, sustaining focus work, being like, like that cognitive flexibility, good working memory, caffeine past a certain point is counterproductive. And so I tend to think of like the nootropic range of caffeine is 50 to 200. Now, if you were going to go to the gym and, you know, try for your personal best weightlifting, you could probably do more of that, but you're not using your brain in the same way. So yes, I, to answer your question, um, I, I think a really useful way for our audience to think about it is with nootropics, there's usually a just right range that is going to be the sweet spot and that more is not going to be better. And that we, we would see the same with choline. So choline is um, the best food source of choline by far would be eggs in, in our, like most people's diets. And the Institute of Medicine going back about say, but like 15, 18 years ago, estimated that somewhere about 80 to 90% of male and female adults didn't get enough choline in their diet. So we get some, we're just not quite in that sweet spot. And choline is important because, you know, among other things, it's the building block for acetylcholine. And the way to think about acetylcholine is acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter we make and secrete when it says, oh, this is really important. Like, do better at finding this in the environment or learning about it, right? So that's why going back to what I mentioned, 10,000 hours without acetylcholine is just wasted. We need the acetylcholine is what then marks relevance and causes us to, to have the neuroplastic, neuroplasticity to learn through that focused effort. And so choline is important for that, but choline is also, as part of phosphatidylcholine, what makes membranes that separate our mitochondria from the inside of cells and our cells from the world around them. And so because of those two roles, choline is really important. But that doesn't mean that we need to get two or three times what the Institute of Medicine would say is a useful amount. We need to get in that range but too much choline and you start to see often like cramps or like tension building up. We're, we're too cholinergic is how you think of it. So, so absolutely, yes. Like I, when I think of putting a nootropic stack together or even using individual compounds, there's, I'm always thinking like, well, what's the sweet spot to be in as, as opposed to I think a lot of people, if X is good, two or three X must be better is, is definitely not the way nootropics work. And that's actually a question I wanted to ask you because it's easy for doing one compound in your formula, maybe two or three, but once you start adding up to 28, like you guys have in quality of mind, how do you know that that ideal Goldilocks dose is what it is? Because say you're taking one thing, they both work in the same two things. They both work in the same pathway. If you take the same amount of, each of them, as you've seen the research, then you're going to be overloading that pathway. Yeah, so that's a great question. So one of the things I know that we do at Neurohacker Collective is when we look at science or studies, so ashwagandha is an example. I remember looking, um, so sensorial, it's not in Qualia Mind, but uh, we don't have ashwagandha in that. But when we were creating Qualia Life, there was a sensorial ashwagandha study that had placebo, had 125 milligrams, and had, I want to say it was 400 milligrams. And what 
was the case in that particular study for what they were measuring, somewhere about 80 to 90% of the benefits happened at 125 milligrams. So there was a little bit more with the higher dose. But now if you're going to combine ashwagandha with other things, and there may be some overlap, let's default to like, let's not chase those small fringe of benefits. Let's go for the lower dose when we're combining it with multiple other things. And then ultimately the proof is in, you know, when the recipe is all put together, how do people feel when they take it? So one of the things we do as part of our um, pre, you know, moving a product into production, actually making it and bringing it to sale is we do something like Quiet Mind. I think there was about four different like small studies, but like what we'll do to start is we'll make enough to take it ourselves and see how we do, right? Like, oh, you know, was how was my productivity today? How were like maybe measure something that that's like finger tapping speed or reaction times, right? Like, is it, you know, is it changing that in a meaningful way? And then if the answer is yes, then we'll get it to more people. And then if the answer is still yes, then we'll do some kind of a small pilot study. Yeah. And I hear that a lot. And it's sad to hear scientists saying, just trust the science. It's like the hallmark of a of bad science. You don't just trust it. You actually have to verify it yourself. And I'm glad to hear that you guys actually do that. And your formulas aren't, they don't just go through one prototype based on what you read each ingredient can do by itself, because you create a whole new compound for, for a better word, whole new product when you combine a bunch of them together. And you have to actually verify that the real world effects are everything that you're expecting. Yeah, so I think of studies as the starting point, you know, so like as an example, I've been working uh, along with Nick, who's been on Nick Bits, who's been on your show in the past, we've been working on what may turn into at some point a joint health product. So what will like our process for that is our process for everything we will start like, all right, let's understand the mechanisms of what's going on here, like, you know, what's happening in aging, uncomfortable joints you know, those give you somewhat of your targets. And then we'll make a crazy long list of potential ingredients or substances to study, which for that product, it's, I think we're like in the mid eighties. And then we'll read, you know, like for each of those, the human studies, some of the, like the animal studies and rated each ingredient one to five. So five means like, that's a rock star, right? Like it did well in multiple studies. Um, and, and I think of, you know, Nick and I were both in practice as naturopathic physicians at one point. Like, to me, a study could show statistically significant effects. I also want to know, was it clinically meaningful? Like, did it move the needle enough? If I had given this to a patient, would they have come and said, oh, Dr. Greg, like I felt this, it, it made a difference. And so, you know, like a five means, yeah, you know, like it's, you know, like it did that in a bunch of different studies. A one means, LOL, like anyone's using this, like you're out of... <laughs> Like, this is nothing, right? And then, you know, like, the hard ones are threes or ones that, like, get to three or four because they're doing something, but probably just not robust, right? So then, you know, what's their goal? And, you know, are they, like, as an example, in a cognitive or nootropic stack, you know, maybe they're just providing building blocks for a neurotransmitter. So, you know, we're not expecting them on their own to really, you know, be noticeable, but they play a role. And so... That's kind of how our process starts. And then once we get that menu ingredients figured out, okay, these are the underlying mechanisms, these are the ones we want to support, then it's all right, let's, you know, start to play mad scientist and put some of these together. And now we'll actually like for joints, we'll probably do at least a four to six week study. And if it doesn't do a pretty significant job, it's like, all right, this just isn't good enough. And then what we do to augment that is because a lot of cool things happen in what I think of as the N of one, right? Like, you know, you know, the subreddits, especially the nootropic subreddit, right? They're the, the people out there that are trying combinations of things. So we also, you know, look to see what other self-experimenters are doing and saying, especially when it comes to some newer things where there's just frankly not what you'd want for the scientific studies. And um, like we have a ingredient in qualunite called polygala, which is um, there's not much. I mean, it's it's been used in Chinese traditional medicine as a cognitive enhancer and for sleep. Um, and there's definitely some animal research. There's just not a lot of human, right? So then it's like, okay, well, 
these things look really cool. Its mechanisms look very, you know, unusual, right? It's hard to find another plant. You know, what are the people taking this alone or stacking it with other things experiencing? So that we try to weigh all of those things at the end of the day and make our, our best guess. But like I said, it's why I think, you know, I was excited when I first joined Neurohacker because of their commitment to testing out products before selling them because that, at least in my experience in the supplement industry going back a couple decades, most other companies just like, oh, let's just put our like a label on our good idea and start selling it. And I'll underscore what you just said about not ignoring those, say, three-star ingredients because back when I was starting to formulate my own nootropics, I would just find five-star ingredient here, five-star ingredient here, combine them, maybe a third or fourth one, and completely neglect the precursors and building blocks And that might work well in the short term, but ultimately you're going to deplete certain neurotransmitters and things you don't want to deplete if you're not also paying attention to what's downstream or upstream of all that. Yeah, I I think uh, like understanding how systems interact together, you know, may change like a three star from its, you know, like the human study on it to like, oh, this is a core thing we need to make sure is supported. You know, and the other thing, you know, quite often, again, you'll see uh, with a lot of building block types of things, you know, like these are your amino acids, the studies often will be really high doses. And, you know, that's used alone, you know, so like tyrosine, as an example, one of my favorite studies on tyrosine was, um, I don't know if they were special forces or just um, re- re- regular um pilots going through search and rescue training. But as part of that, they get captured and interrogated. And in that particular study, they gave a high dose of tyrosine and then put these people through this like intense interrogation. And the ability to to sustain anger was a lot better. Like you should be angry, right? When getting, you know, beaten up and, you know, mentally harassed. And so that like it gave them more resources to sustain that. And tyrosine is a building block for something like dopamine, but also for epinephrine. And it was funny, I, I saw then some influencers misunderstand that study. Like, oh, don't take high amounts of tyrosine, it'll make you angry. It's like, no, it allowed you to be more angry when that was the right thing to be under the circumstances, which is very different than you know, taking it and make you angry. So the, that's the other piece too, when, when I read studies is what's the context because often I, I um, see that piece missed a lot. Unfortunately, there's a lot of those studies where it's like, I've looked through them like, oh, this is so promising, so cool. Then I'll look at like the subjects that they're studying. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that applies to me. And so, it, and it may, but, you know, it's it's that context. Like I'm very, I use the word context a lot. I use the word relationship a lot in, in my normal life. I think the relationship we have with things matter, the context that something's done in matters and so you know all of those things um influence you know um you know if we were to like quiet mind was created very much as a nootropic with that you know focus concentration more executive function goal in mind it wasn't created to say oh like what's the best thing we could put together for someone 65 worried about declining memory now is it useful for that um yeah like it was um, Heather Sanderson, she's a naturopathic doctor that owns a, a medical home here in San Diego County and a practice. She recently did a study using the Bredesen protocol approach to helping people that already had some degree of cognitive decline. And um, in that, she used qualia mind as kind of her brain multivitamin is how she described it. So everyone was put on it, not to necessarily... Um, you know, do something to reverse what's a, you know, what's a very challenging health situation. But her thought was, okay, I'm going to do personalized things with all these people and do a bunch of integrated things because these are challenging, complex people. And I want them all to have good baseline support for their brain. I'll use Qualia Mind for that piece. A couple minutes ago, you mentioned that when you're designing studies, you look at certain endpoints and you decide if the formula makes sense based on what you're seeing as a result there, like say reaction time or memory, working memory, 
How do you decide those? And are you ever wonder or worried that you might miss something that's important? Like you might forget to look at reaction speed. And that's one of the variables that does change. And the things you looked at didn't change. There's certain things like caffeine, since you know we, we mentioned that. Like caffeine, where it's most... I would say most reliable in terms of, you know, where it's going to move the needle is in, and think of, again, go back to that attention domain, right? So this is your ability to, you know, get focused and avoid distractions and to have quicker or faster reaction times and um, processing speed. Like caffeine in studies just does a really robust job at that. You just see study after study, it does well. Working memory, caffeine's much more, you know, like a mixed would be the, the fairest way. Like in some studies, it improved it. Others, it did nothing. Um, and then you start to think, okay, well, why? And then, you know, the general thought is, again, that idea, there's a range. Um, you know, if someone's really habituated to caffeine versus like new to caffeine, that makes a difference. Um, caffeine's much more likely to do positives on executive function when you're sleep deprived than if you're rested, you know, so that like that contextual. And so then for me, it's like, okay, well, I can rely on caffeine to do these things, but not so much the working memory. Like what's, what's an ingredient that might stack with caffeine that's much more predictably going to work on that piece because caffeine may but it may not it's more context and so that's how you know like i'll you know think of these different cognitive skills and be looking to see if if an ingredient is good at a certain thing and then okay is it like ashwagandha as an example i love ashwagandha we have it in a couple products but there's a subset of people that that ashwagandha over time is almost too relaxing so what you'll see in you know comments sometimes on Reddit, and this isn't most people, but it is some people, is that they yeah that it like it almost feels like they're not as motivated. Like it's um, kryptonite for motivation for them is a way to think about it, and that doesn't mean that like ashwagandha is bad for everyone, but for those people, it's it's um, you know it's not the motivating thing. So like I don't think I think of ashwagandha. We have it in Qualia Night as an example. We have it in our our, our stress product, Qualia Resilience. But even in Qualia Resilience, we sourced, it's called Nuganda, and it was a, an ashwagandha made to be a cognitive ashwagandha. So what they did is when they made the extract, they um, extracted it in a way so that the more calming things, the things that work on more of the GABA system, were things they extracted out. Like they wanted those other things that help with stress, but not those things that were too relaxing. So we think of qualia resilience as an example, as a nootropic for stress, right? Like I've taken it at the beginning of the day, every day for a month, instead of qualia mind, I'm still productive, alert all day, right? It, it, it helps with stress, but we didn't want to sacrifice focus to get more stress relief. We, we wanted our cake and to eat it too, right? So that, that caused us to go for a different ashwagandha where Sensoril and KSM-66 are great ashwagandhas, but they would be much more the ones that an individual, and again, this isn't most individuals, it's a thin sliver, would take and feel like, oh, it sapped my motivation to get things done. So, you know, we tend to, like I said, we use KSM-66 at night because that's for nighttime, right, where you want relaxation we don't really care if someone's crazy you know willpower motivated <laughs> at night we want what little they have just to be turned into um getting enough sleep daniel smockenberg is one of our founders and he was the the one that said this to me at the get-go when he hired me was you know what what i want is that i think that there's always um super responders or potentially super responders responders non-responders and negative responders and what you'd see, you know, in most things is a bell curve with most people as, you know, re regular responders and non-responders. And what I want to do is shift the bell curve. So I want way more super responders than you'd normally see. I don't want the negative responders. And I'm okay if we get like one out of five people that are non-responders, as long as we shift things in that direction. So that's always our goal. So two things here. 
How do you guys go about shifting the curve to get more super responders? And then also on a personal level, are there ways besides trial and error, which is what I primarily do, to determine if you're going to be a super responder to any particular ingredient or to any class of ingredients? I've previously used something called the Braverman test, which is like a long questionnaire and like assesses your neurotransmitter dominances and deficiencies. And lo and behold, I do very well with GABAergics, the compounds that increase GABA, and they tend to work great for me. It just has the questionnaire predicted, but I get that it doesn't work perfectly for everyone. Are there any tools or ways that you like to look at it? So there was two questions in there. Let's go to the Braverman first. So I think of things like that as useful. They're not perfect, right? But they might yeah. give us an insight that's that we can build off. Um, and, you know, genetics potentially, right? But that's a lot of that still being sorted out. And then the other piece, I, again, I go back to context. So I spent most of my time in the Navy fairly sleep deprived, not by choice, but just by, yeah. you know, like shift work, rotate. I, there was a about a two year period, I stood a watch in engineering that only two of us could stand. So when our ship had its boilers lit off, um, which was a fair amount of time, um, we, we called it port and starboard, but six hours on six hours off watch. And then you still had to do your job. You still had to, wow. you know, like exercise, eat, like <sighs> you name it. Right. So like you never even got like a full six hour window in 24 hours to sleep. And mm. so the Greg that might respond to something as a super responder in that context uh, is maybe different than the Greg that's getting enough sleep and that pays attention to circadian rhythms and other things, right? So context always matters. And what I've seen fairly routinely in, you know, in my life and diets are like a, a useful thing. So my, um, one of my diet mentors was of the opinion that there can be a big difference between a diet that takes you from the diet you are on to healthier and a diet that'll then keep you at healthier, right? And so I always try to think in terms of let's not get too attached to the tool, right? To the thing that we're using to get better health because that our response to that may change. Let's pay attention to how we're responding. And so I know like for nootropics, for me, when I first started as an example on Qualia Mind, there was a few things I paid attention to every day. But one was d that tendency that many people have to that post-lunch, mid-afternoon slump, right? Like that almost feeling like, oh, my brain's a little bit, you know, like running in slow motion, right? Maybe even needing a nap. And so I paid a lot of attention to that, like is what happens when I take Qualia Mind. And to this day still, if I take Qualia Mind, I just power right through. I never have. I, personally, I don't experience that. Um, I think most nootropics, you would feel something fairly shortly, right? Like an hour, two hour, like, oh, like I'm, like I'm ready to go, right? So I pay attention to that. But we talked about brain energy earlier in the day. And a story that I like to share is about my dad. So my dad, you know, I, I grew up in a near Cape like about 35 miles outside of Boston, near Plymouth, Mass, little beach town. But my dad had a crazy commute in, to Boston, right? 35 miles, but probably two hour drive each way. And, you know, was a executive, was in charge of a 5,000 person engineering company. So, you know, demanding job. And like my recollection of my dad, he'd come home and be like, we'd be on eggshells because sometimes... Like best case, it would be neutral. He'd just do his own thing. But, you know, other times that he would just be, you know, more irritable, right? So something that we would do would be upsetting to him, right? We'd get yelled at or, you know, told to quiet down, whatever. Um, and the way I think of that now with what I know about the brain is my dad's brain had just depleted most of the resources, right? That would allow him to be that better version of himself that he was at the beginning of the day or would be on a Saturday night as an example. And that if he was given an opportunity to rest and recover, uh, the brain does a good job of then, you know, moving things from where they weren't used to where they're more needed. Right. So if my dad was given that space to you know shine his shoes and tinker, my dad liked to do, um, you know, like things with his hands, like leather work and things like that, then he would, like get into that better space. So long story short, one of the things I think is a great test for nootropics like while you mind is 
at the end of our day, are we still able to be a better version of ourselves? Right? Because that's the test, right? Did, did the brain have more resources to get through the day? And still at the end, when we show up for our significant others, like instead of them getting the worst version of ourselves for an hour or two, are they still getting a decent version? So those are the things I, I pay attention to. Even when we do tests on a new nootropic stack, I'm always looking like, okay, what happened an hour or two, four hours later, but what's happening at the end of your day? I have a question for you about how you would approach this. And it's going to be, I'm sure, unique to me, but hopefully your thinking, your methodology will help people. So there's an ingredient in Qualia Mind called N-acetyl-L-tyrosine, or NALT for short, I believe. And I first used that probably about 10 or so years ago. And I used it, I bought like a 50 gram bag of it and used a normal dose and use it one time and felt like a robot and never touched it again after that. And I've noticed when I take Qualia Mind, every once in a while, I'll feel that same like robotic feeling, but for the most part, I don't. And I'm curious how you would approach this and figure out what about that compound is causing this effect if I'm deficient in something and when I have adequate levels, I no longer feel it or why it is that I'm feeling this and how I can go about preventing that. So that when I take quality, it feels good consistently every single time. So NALT is for the audience. So N-acetyl tyrosine is a tyros- form of tyrosine. Um, and tyrosine's, you know, mostly thought of as the building block for dopamine and for norepinephrine. Um, you know, so it could be either of those systems, right? Those are pretty important, you know, um, systems for especially daytime brain performance. Um, and then NALT doesn't have many human studies, very few, um, even relatively few animal studies. So um, most studies are just plain L-tyrosine, not the acetylated NALT version. And like, I guess, NALT versus L-tyrosine, mostly that's the N of one, like the self-experimented people, like nootropic communities that people will like, oh, like for some reason, NALT at lower doses, I seem to feel, you know, more dopaminergic than I do with tyrosine. Um, so usually you think of NALT as something that, you know, four to 800 milligrams is, you know, sufficient. Um, but like I mentioned with choline, and there's like, we try to be in the sweet spot for choline, making up for that gap that the average person isn't getting the, their diet. But if someone was eating, say like a lot of eggs every day, the chances that they need choline are lower, right? So, you know, so my first thing is like, you know, are, are you, is your diet high in protein? Yes. In which case you're probably more than adequate in tyrosine because tyrosine, you know, is um, it, like relatively awesome. high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you m- maybe don't need any of that um, like precursor tyrosine. You know, then I would think, oh, if, if they're getting this once in a while, then, you know, like, are you taking a break from quality of mind periodically? Like I said earlier, like five days on two off, I'm guessing yes. But then one of the things with quality of mind, we, you know, um, often do ourselves, I know I do it, is every about two months, I cycle off it just like I would do a deloading week for exercise and just take a break from it. Um, and so that would be another. And then the, the last is um, often like our recommendation is seven capsules a day. And that's the most common dose that customers take. But my most common dose is four. Because through like trial and error, I found like, oh, four is sufficient for me to have a really productive day. So I mean, I could take seven, I don't need seven. But if I was, you know, driving to Las Vegas for something or had to do a trade show or, you know, something much more demanding for my brain, then I'll do seven those days. So the the way if I was working with you, like as a patient back when I was in practice, my first thing would be, okay, let's, let's do less. You, you probably don't need as much of this. So instead of seven capsules, you know, let's, I often um, like to err on the conservative side. Well, so let's just go to two and see how you do on two capsules. That may be sufficient for where you're at. Um, and then we can always work up a little from there if it's not quite delivering what you hope. Yeah, based on all this, what I'm imagining is I think I have tried the non-acetylated version of L-tyrosine, just normal L-tyrosine in 
alpha brain or something and it had the same effect so it's probably not just the acetylated version it's the both versions so for me i guess the first thing i would try is to i guess the day before and the day of consume a little less protein in my diet and make sure i'm not getting too much of any one amino acid like l-tyrosine from diet and then see how i react to that i've already my sweet spot is tends to be around two to three capsules anyway so I prefer that dosage. I find that like, if I go too high, then it is more likely to bring out that side effect. So for me, that's like the sweet spot. Well, and then the other thing too is, um, so quality of focus as an example is uh, in, oh, another one of our nootropic stacks. And uh, I am like almost a hundred percent certain that has no NALT in it, right? That was just built in a different way to be a two capsule thing, right? And precursor like NALT you need enough of to make a difference so that would be a different experiment try quite focus maybe that works you know it's 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 a simple and nootropic but it's still a it works great right it's a um you know, one that i often will cycle in myself um and then the other one would be when i think of like what prevents most people from getting into that you know that flow state that focus um and this oversimplifies it but think of like one group the challenge is that they they don't have the motivation, right? They're they're almost like a little lethargic, right? It's it's just not that exciting to get into it. Another group, what's causing them from getting focus is their brain's too frantic. Like there's almost too much going on, right? So quality of mind helps move people towards focus from either end, but it was more created to overcome that lethargy, that like to actually think of adding motivation and willpower in with nootropics, right? Like the, the NALT and the Mukuna and things like that, that are more, you know, like dopamine forward where, um, qualia resilience, our stress product was more designed for helping people that were on that frantic end come to balance. So qualia resilience acts as a new, we, we, it's our stress product, but, but it will help with focus for a lot of people. Cause it's for that end, they actually don't need those things that would help to overcome lethargy. They need something that's going to somewhat, and this is oversimplifying, but quiet that frantic activity of the brain. And so um, for me, I've done like a month straight of only quiet resilience instead of quiet mind or quiet focus. And it still works, right? I still am productive. It still does what a good nootropic would do. It's just designed or optimized for someone maybe more like yourself that like it's the gabinergic end of things that they need a bit more support on. So that would be another experiment is that quiet mind just might not be a product that is ideally situated or, you know, for your brain, it still does something useful, but that quiet resilience, a quiet focus might um, actually be more optimal for you. Yeah, I found that. And I still really like the effects I get from quality of mind when I don't have the side effect, but when I have the side <laughs> effect, it's hard. It's like, it tints the the way I see things. All right. So I've gotten some questions from my audience about like the side effects and safety of like nootropics and particularly of the qualia line. They're just curious about like how this fares and how you make sure that this is a safe product. Because if you actually Google nootropics, I did some consultancy work for a nootropic startup a while back. And like, the first article when you search are nootropics safe or do they work was like a WebMD or something that said that they don't work and they have no efficacy, no science, which is ludicrous because there's a lot out there. But how do you make sure that this is safe? I know you do the clinical trials or the in-house trials that you're mentioning, but like what can people expect when they use nootropics? So like nootropics is a category as opposed to a thing, right? And I think of it as a category, you know, primarily, you know, focus, motivation, memory would be the the things people usually want when they're talking about a nootropic, but like racetams, which are more drug-like compounds, you know, would be a very different nootropic than caffeine, which would be different than, you know, ginkgo or L-theanine, right? So, so like an analogy that I tend to use, I mentioned that upside down U-curve earlier. And when I think of that curve, the bottom I always think of is like a duration of time, right? So, you know, exercise we start exercising today we're gonna like improve we're gonna go up that beginning of the hill right 
keep doing the same exercise, we may at some point plateau, right? So we're not getting worse, but we may not be getting improvement anymore. And then, you know, if we keep doing that same thing, we run the risk of maybe overtraining, right? Performance starts to suffer. So I tend to think of most things as, as having the potential to go through that curve, right? And that what I think of then is what's going up the this side of it is the intensity we're doing something, which in a nootropic is the dose, like the amount of the substance we're taking. And so I think when I think of things, like my goal is, all right, well, if I said, hey, Nick, why don't you go run a marathon every other weekend for the next six months, and then we'll just check in, right? Like, in, are marathons good or bad? Well, let's see how Nick does. Probably not good. Right? Now, if I said, like, Nick, could you, like, I don't know, like, walk every day for 20 minutes for me for the next six months? Let's check in. Probably at the end of the six months, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm doing great. And a difference there is then... The time was the same, right? Six months, but the intensity, the amount of what we're doing varied substantially, right? So it's, I know when I create formulas, like the goal is like, let's keep people on the walking side of things when we choose the amount of something. So one of the things that I think make like allows things like nootropics to be safer is when we're not trying to go to the extreme top end of a dose range for something, right? We're more conservative. Um, when we do things like, oh, don't take this every day, you know, like let's build in mini vacations once a week for two days, right? Um, those things, instead of that time period being crunched down like it would be in a marathon, because six months would wreck most of us, it spreads that time out longer. We can still get the benefits without getting past that peak. And so when I think of you know, like whether it's vitamin C exercise, you know, a, a purely nootropic compound, I'm, I'm always thinking of that upside down U curve and how we can get the benefits like being like moving up the hill with spreading out that time so we can enjoy it for long periods of time. So when nootropics, what I would say for your listener or the person that asked that is, you know, whenever you're concerned about that, do less and then take many vacations more. Yeah, I think that's a very safe and prudent strategy. I personally take two weeks off of caffeine every quarter. And then I will also rotate off all of my nootropics for a different two weeks because sometimes the non-caffeine nootropics are nice to have when you're going through the two weeks with no caffeine. And it seems that like it resensitizes my body, my neurotransmitters to the effects of these compounds to begin with, which is like a win-win and makes it so I get better results from less like smaller doses. Absolutely. And I think that's like, that's the best advice I could give exactly what you're doing. Greg, we've been on this for over an hour already. I want to be respectful of your time. I have a couple more questions for you and then a rapid fire round. Sure. Well, first of all, if people are interested in connecting with you and checking out the Neurohacker line of nootropics and other products, how do they go about that? So our website's neurohacker.com. Um, we're biggest on social media on Instagram. That's where we put the most content and do the most for our community. And a, a lot of what's put there would be things like, you know, new studies and details on those or, you know, um, cool things. So I would say follow us on Instagram would be number one. Um, but check out neurohacker.com. Um, like you, we have our own podcast that, you know, we do things to try to educate the community. And then I, Whenever we do have a product, I'll blog about that product. So for something like Qualia Mind, it'll, the title will be something like Qualia Mind, the formulator's view of the ingredients. And so I'll talk about, you know, each ingredient, why I chose that dose. So if you ever want to get nerdy about one of our products, just look for those blog posts. And if people are interested in trying out Qualia Mind or Focus or Resilience, I believe we have the code URBAN, which will save them 15%. So the link to that will be in the show notes below, as well as all the resources we've discussed so far. All right, Greg, if there was a burning of the books and all knowledge on earth was lost, but you got to save the works of three teachers, what would you pick and why? Taleb, for sure. Um, Anti-Fragile, I mean, all his books, Anti-Fragile, Skin in the Game, um, you know, fooled by randomness. I think his models for thinking about uncertainty and, 
you know, we all want more certainty in life, like, but health is an uncertain thing, right? It's much more like investing in stocks than it is black or white. And he's, I think he is the, he's the best in my experience at giving useful models for that. So um, him for sure. Um, I've always been a huge fan of The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, just the little, you know, like um, vignettes, right? I, I think there's so much wisdom in that. And I think wisdom holds up and where like a lot of things, I, I, I read a lot, a lot of things that I read five, 10 years from now aren't going to be particularly useful. Um, and then, you know, I think something enjoyable. <laughs> so for me, it'd be Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, I mean, I think different things for different people, but you know, something like it's the one book or book series that I've read the most times in my life. So those, I mean, there's, I think, wisdom that you get from seeing people do noble works, right? Like helping each other and overcoming obstacles. And sometimes it's in stories that we learn those things the best. So those would be the three. Nice balance. All right, rapid fire round. In your Qualia Mind product, which would you say are the five star ingredients and what are the most essential supporting ingredients? So I think the for me, caffeine and theanine, clearly five stars, cognizant, which is the um, acetylcholine, which is a, a choline precursor, is another five stars. There's others, but those three for sure, those are you know fundamental for a good stack. Um, complementary ingredients. So I think like you, the NALT that you mentioned, the Makuna, things that are you know supportive for the dopamine system all f- fall in that range. But it, I, I think things that get overlooked a lot is a huge amount of the health of our neurons and the health of the supporting cells, the glial cells in our brain, is the health of their neurons. And things like phosphatidylserine and the omega-3 DHA fatty acid just make up such a high percentage of those and that they're i think of them as brain essential nutrients meaning if we don't get enough in our diet our brain's going to be starved for them and so they're not things that would show up as five stars in human studies because they just play a different role but critical role phosphatidylserine is pretty interesting i was looking into the anti-cortisol effects for that like post-workout if i work out in the evening that's a, a great one okay what ingredient supplement substance are you currently researching these days so I've mostly been focused on joint health. Um, but the one that I most recently read, it's a combination of, of Boswellia extract and Terminalia Shibuya, which um, the, they're both Ayurvedic herbs. But Boswellia usually think of more for like either like gut health or for joint health. And Terminalia in, in Ayurvedic, um, you often see it combined with Amla fruit and another it's uh, triphala is the it's like it's called the three the three mirabolums um but that stack that thing and part of the reason it grabbed my attention is they just released a um a cognitive study it's it's actually now in the process of being published so they're only sharing like you know a little bit of the information but what they shared was really exciting because i read a lot of studies on cognitive ingredients and mostly i come away um, unimpressed. <laughs> and this one is like, wow, if the study, you know, is doing what you're sharing that it did, that's pretty impressive. So that, that ingredient, um, is the one that, um, I, I got like a, um, I guess I was allowed to see the, the study I signed an NDA, so I can't really talk about it, but I was very impressed with what that delivered. So we've talked a lot about some more the more advanced stacks and the things ingredients you have in Qualia Mind. Can you rat, rattle off a few essential like beginners nootropics that you recommend? Like the combination of caffeine, the amino acid L-theanine is like a popular one, like a good intro to nootropics. Anything else? Yeah. So I think um, choline, like some source of choline. So again, if if like a lot of um, biohackers eat eggs, right? They get, they getting enough choline, but an average person, no, right? So um, it doesn't mean they're getting none, but there's usually somewhere like about a hundred milligram, 150 milligram gap between what would be ideal and what they're getting in their diet. So something that's going to supply some choline for a lot of people is a good thing to consider if, you know, if they're not getting eggs. Um, 
I tend to like adaptogen herbs a lot. And um, rhodiola is so different adaptogens. We, we talked about ashwagandha, which can be almost too calming for a small subset of people. Rhodiola is a um, from the like the Balkan area, right? N- Northern Europe. And that tends to be more energizing, for lack of a better word, to think. So that can be a good, uh, you know, um, addition to like a nootropic stack because it's adaptogenic, right? It helps with stress, but it's a more invigorating than ashwagandha would be. So even like a simple stack like that could be a really nice place to start. And then, you know, often like a little magnesium, B vitamins or the foundation, right? So you'll see those in quiet focus. You'll see those in quiet resilience. Uh, you like, well, you always put a B vitamin stack into those because, um, you know, when you think of like making energy, that's where the bees, like we, we need them. Well, Greg, this has been great. What is one thing that the neurohacker tribe does not know about you? Um, I don't know. I'm pretty much an open book, <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's see. Well, no one on neurohackers tribe has ever seen me with hair, but that's too easy. <laughs> um, so everyone knows that I'm a huge sports fan. I don't know. I honestly, I, so like long story short, I went through alcohol rehab my last beginning of my last year in the Navy. And one of the things like I came out of that able to drink again, you know, this was Mm. 1988. So a long time ago, right? Like if I was delusional, it would have (laughs) shown up by now, (laughs) but I'm, I'm by nature a teetotaler now, but part of what changed is things that I was in my closet, right? Afraid that other people might know or find out about me. I just revealed it all. Well, are there any conclusions, any takeaways you want to leave listeners with today? So I would say, um, do your own experiments, you know, so don't rely on the experts, like see how you respond, um, be attached to how you're responding, not how you responded, right? So be flexible, right? Like what may have worked great for you, you know, it may not continue to, right? And it's why you and I have, you know, like, you know, we've, figured out our own do- dose for quality of mind and our own ways to go, you know, rotate it in and out to get the best for it. And then the um, last piece would be that bandwidth piece. So I think many of us are, um, our brains aren't performing the best that they can because there's lots that we are ruminating on, right? Like that, that our bandwidth is being consumed. So um, the last piece of advice would be if that's you, right? If your brain is ruminating on things, most of the time, and not all the time, but uh, most of the time, there's something we can do that will cause that rumination to quiet, right? to to not take up so many resources. And the brain, as we talked about at the beginning, is something that, you know, thinking about in terms of resources and energy is a useful model. And if we're consuming a lot of that ruminating about something, then there's going to be less resources and energy to go to the parts of the brain we want to you know do more so we can be more so anyways that would be the last piece for the audience if you feel like oh my my bandwidth's being consumed by something figure out if there's something you can do to shut that down there are in most cases there is so well dr greg kelly it has been a pleasure chatting with you and hosting you on the mind body peak performance podcast well thanks for having me today it's been my pleasure Until next time, I'm Nick Urban here with Dr. Greg Kelly signing out from mindbodypeak.com. Have a great week and be an outlier. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. Dot com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.